Uh, I prefer gold to silver, you know, for my metal. I figured you'd recommend me for one since I, uh, pulled your boots out of the fire. If we present you with a medal, you'll end up sitting on stage listening to politicians make speeches for a couple of hours. Fun, fun. That's a good point. They'd probably make me shave, too. I spent the last seven weeks working on this baby. No medal's worth that. So, Commander, why don't you tell me why you're really here? How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean... You mean you didn't know? Oh, crap. Okay, I've got Vrolix syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic, but I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. I need to know more about this Vrolix Syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Yeah, of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure. They classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures. Hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already breaking in the womb. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. You're not gonna break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I gotta be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Let's talk about something else. Whatever you want, Commander. Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. You're dodging the question. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, mm, and it stuck. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. How'd you end up joining the Alliance? Look, if you're looking for an inspirational tale of the crippled kid overcoming impossible odds, you're gonna be disappointed. My mother was a civilian contractor working for the Alliance. I basically grew up on the Arcturus station back when they were building up the fleets. Spend all that time around Alliance ships, there's a good chance you'll end up going to the Academy. I have to go. 
If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, sir. Understood, sir. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school. Following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were at Elysium during the Scillian Blitz. A massive fleet of alien raiders hit the colony, trying to wipe it out. They had the numbers, but their ships were no match for an Alliance frigate. It was a slaughter. We couldn't even keep track of how many ships they lost. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. Carry on, Presley. Yes, sir. Tally, she's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You got an eye for Tally, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented our silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. 
Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus drive core. What's so special about the Tantalus drive core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype. Cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now. I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government? The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials. In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives, but in theory we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty, and they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. 
In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Get. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So, the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So they're some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian Overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us. So we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exile, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. It's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them?
You make a good point. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get so worked up. Most Quarians tend to have pretty strong opinions about the Geth. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? That doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I should go.